So apparently I don't need this one. Yes. You want the other one? I no. Can you listen to me? Yes. Oh, great. Um, yes, I have this one. I think yesterday I moved a lot on the stage, so now they came prepared <laughs> for this. I let me just open up here. So okay, good. I just uh, put this. So, good afternoon everyone, I want to thank you so much for yesterday, I promised that today I wouldn't cry again, but I nearly cried because I had technical challenge with my presentation, but I thank you a lot for being here, and I think this, this moment, I have already had a, a fair share of uh, moments on stage, but honestly, situations like those are the ones that make me the most nervous because I really believe in you and I really want you to feel like you can change things and you can really live in a society where you would like to live. So what I decided to do today is to talk a bit on how we can act at the local level and be global at the same time through what we call water entrepreneurship. So you heard a bit about the three hats that I wear. I'm only one person, but I'm trying to divide myself in those multiple roles. And so, but I, before I, I go into detail on how I work and my experience, I just want to make sure that we are clear on some uh, concepts. And, well, what is entrepreneurship? So, we might have heard this a lot. An entrepreneur, I am a social entrepreneur, entrepreneurship. So, entrepreneurship is actually the activity. If you look at the dictionary, if you Google it, you find explanations, definitions that'll tell you that entrepreneurship is to is the activity to set up a business venture or to start a business and take all the risks of modeling, of making it happen. And then when we come to social entrepreneurship, we have a really interesting difference that is to try to develop a business or initiative, take the risks of it, but focusing on developing solutions to social, cultural, environmental challenges. That's why I am what it's called a social entrepreneur, because I am leading an initiative. It's an enterprise, like any other enterprise, but it's a non-profit one, so we're not focusing on having billions in our account, and I don't think we would make that by what we do. But, and we actually don't need that, and we try to tackle some interesting um, challenge that we face in Brazil, and I hope to give you a proper context of those so that we, you understand what we do and why we do it. And what we talk about for entrepreneurship. So for me, this is when you try to have this entrepreneurial attitude, this proactiveness towards designing services and products that will improve the world's water situation. So either improve water use, reduce consumption, improve water management. So that's what I would call water entrepreneurship, okay? I want to make this informal. I'm even wearing jeans, so it's, not, it's fine. <laughs> But really, uh, I hope to cover topics like uh, quickly and then open for questions. Yesterday, a lot of you approached me uh, in the cafeteria with very interesting question. I didn't have time to cover all of those in the presentation, but you're free to ask, okay? And then I hope to you leave here with all your questions answered. 
Um, so, yesterday I kind of provoked you, at least most of you, who I believe were here yesterday for the Illuminati Award, asking you what do we do to change the situation that we live today, right? Yeah, did you thought about it? Like, oh my god, what do I do? Or no? Yes? No? Nobody thought about it? <laughs> really? <laughs> but it was really, the idea was to force you to reflect that uh, sometimes we, we live our lives and we focus too much on our needs, on our ambitions, on our individual goals. And it's very easy to forget the whole context and the whole perspective of the world we live at. So that was more to kind of, uh, you know, assimilate and encourage you to think in a broader perspective. So what do we do to change the, thing, the, the situation we live now? I honestly never expected to be here today. When I graduated from IIT, if you ask it me, I would never say that I would be here as a social entrepreneur. The world, let's say, that I had ahead of me was a totally different one. I actually saw myself uh, going for different experience. And so that's why today I will try to explain a little bit what do I do, how do I do, why do I do, and hope you understand how my career came to be what it is now, and how do I try to change the reality that I live in, okay? So... What? Someone's losing WhatsApp. Please, ah, sorry, I thought it was me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I'll try to cover a little bit uh, about my three hats, and I will start with Favela, which is the one that the Vice Spectrum introduced me about. I'm the co-founder and project director of Favela. And I have a, a video with uh, English subtitles to show you, but before I introduce this video to you, I just want you to learn a bit more about Brazil. Yesterday I told you how important it is to never forget where you came from, right? To never forget your neighborhood, the reality of your city or your region. So the first thing we should do in order to be a water entrepreneur or in order to really try to change things is to, is to figure out and to learn how things are. So what is the situation where I come from? Where is the situation in my city regarding water but regarding all the other development challenges that there are here to address? So talking a bit about Brazil, that red dot is where I live. That's Belo Horizonte. Nobody knows because Belo Horizonte is in the shadows of Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo. And I agree, Rio de Janeiro is much more interesting. They have the sea, it's a beautiful city. But Belo Horizonte is quite a big place. Uh, our population now, it's around uh, 5 million people. So it's quite a big city. And if you look to Belo Horizonte, we are in the southeast region of Brazil. So we are not close to the Amazon region. That's really important to highlight because people would think that I would go to the Amazon every weekend and no, it's not close. So it's like, it's really far. But okay, Belo Horizonte has only in that city, so we're not counting on the municipalities in the metropolitan region, 215 favelas. So 215 areas market in the city that are categorized in urban planning as we would call slums, okay? But in Brazil, we use the word favela. This corresponds to 82% of the favelas in the whole province that I live. So this is all concentrated in the capital city of Belo Horizonte. Those favelas, they are home to 300,000 people, which is close to 20% of the population. And if you look at Brazil, we have around 15 million people living in favelas and one in eight in the world. 
And then here, the first thing we have to be aware of is that when we talk about slum environments, the first challenge is accurate data. If you really have been to a slum, who has ever been to a slum? Nice, many of you. I think you would know for sure that it's very hard to collect data there, or data, I always get confused with the English. Because things change too fast, people move, lives are happening such a speed, that it's not that easy to track. So sometimes you interview people and some, you know, you have five people living in their house and then suddenly they turn to seven and then people change and give birth and move to other cities. So it's very difficult to have accurate data. So always question the numbers you have. Second tip. When you look to Belo Horizonte and Brazil as a whole, and I imagine your cities have the same uh, geographic constitution in a way. Um, income, wealth, is really related to color. So we have an inequality issue that is quite strong to Brazil, but it's strongly linked to racial issues. So you usually find people of uh, African descendants, black people, being the poorest ones. And this is a, 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 a map of my city in which they show you, uh, these are the neighborhoods, and when you see uh, the blue dots, this is where most people who declare to be white in the last census are living. These are the wealthiest regions in my city. These are what we call the richest neighborhoods. While all the other areas, this is where you have most of the black population living, and which are, this is where most of the slums of the favelas are located. So this goes a lot with what we see here, and you will see during a master, with the peri-urban uh, logics of cities. And where the poorest are located are where the most developing challenges we there, there are to address. Is this similar to some of your cities or not? Yes? Talking about income, Brazil is famous worldwide for its inequality, and just to give you some numbers, we have 10% of the population of the country sharing 43% of all the income generated in 2017. And if you look at uh, wage, for instance, you have 1% of the population making 27,000 reais a month. I'm not sure how much is that in euros, I think you should divide by four or five. And while the average income of a Brazilian citizen is only 1,000 reais a month. So that's quite a big difference if you, to, if you look at how income is distributed. And when we look at people our age, if you take Brazil into account, we have 48 million people around between 15 to 29 years old. We are a population now of 200, nearly 200 million people. So young generation, the younger generation correspond to quite a big component of our society. And from this total, 11 million do not work or study. So basically they concluded high school and they are just there without having opportunities to study or to work. So by giving you some context about Brazil, I will now play you a video that tells a bit about favela and how we work. And I want you to watch this and watch what we do, but having in mind this contest and trying to think of what problems we try to address with what we do, okay? O Favela, a gente é uma organização da sociedade civil e ela nasceu da ideia de um grupo de moradores de vilas e favelas que teve acesso à educação superior e a gente queria, de alguma forma, devolver essas oportunidades que a gente teve para as comunidades onde a gente veio. Então a gente falou assim, ah, vamos criar um projeto de educação empreendedora. 
Nos nossos dois primeiros anos de atividade, nós aceleramos 60 negócios de periferia com o Pipa e o Resiliente, mobilizamos mais de 600 pessoas em cinco edições do Paula Favela, oferecemos 1.200 horas de capacitação em gestão de marcas e negócios, com o apoio de mais de 200 voluntários de universidades, instituições estrangeiras, empresas e outras organizações do terceiro setor. A gente começou realmente a buscar muitos conceitos, muitas né, variáveis do que, que poderia fazer referência ao trabalho que a gente identificava que essas pessoas já faziam dentro da favela. Então a gente começou realmente a observar mais, estudar, a gente identificou esse conceito que a favela usa hoje, que a gente adotou como base dos nossos projetos, que é o empreendedorismo de base favelada. Que é essa correria que a galera faz dentro da favela sem muitos recursos, sem muitos acessos, para poder gerar renda, colocar o feijão na lata e criar negócios super inovadores. Então a gente tem histórias aí realmente dentro dos projetos que o favela apoiou, que reforçam cada vez mais realmente a existência desse empreendedorismo de base favelada. E a partir daí tudo foi muito rápido e hoje a gente trabalha realmente com quatro projetos voltados para a educação empreendedora. Um deles é o PIPA, né, que é um programa de aceleração para pessoas a partir de 18 anos, onde a gente parte da parte, da parte de gestão, comunicação e marketing, voltado realmente para ajudar pequenos negócios a melhorarem e gerar mais renda para esses indivíduos. A gente tem o Favela Resiliente, que é um programa voltado também de aceleração, mas mais voltado para impacto socioambiental dentro das comunidades, né? trabalhar uma lógica desses empreendedores trabalhar com o uso de resíduos, para geração de renda. A gente também tem um projeto que é mais voltado para jovens, que é o Corre Criativo, onde que a gente trabalha com os jovens labbers, os makers e os hackers da favela mesmo com o uso de tecnologias para que eles possam melhorar a vida da comunidade e também criar projetos e negócios para geração de renda. Né? Então a lógica realmente é fazer frente às oportunidades que a gente vê que surgem dentro da favela para a galera mais jovem ganhar uma grana e eles ganharam uma grana honesta empreendendo. E o Fala Favela, que é um projeto que a gente ama mesmo, que é um projeto voltado para dar voz à periferia. A gente trabalha com uma lógica de selecionar quatro histórias por noite e de levar esses heróis e essas heroínas da favela para poder inspirar outras pessoas a empreender e também serem mais resilientes no dia a dia com o trabalho que eles já fazem dentro da comunidade. Meu nome é Gilmar Elisa, tenho 39 anos, moro aqui no aglomerado. Meu nome é Wenderson Moreira, sou morador aqui da comunidade do Morro do Papagaio, nascido e criado aqui. Pipa e o favela para mim foi tudo, porque quando eu conheci o Pipa eu tinha somente um salão de beleza, né? Depois que eu conheci o Pipa, assim, minha vida mudou toda, porque eu já comecei a sonhar em ter um spa. Sou idealizador do OPA, que é O Planeta Agradece. A gente trabalha com a lavagem de carro ecológica, que em vez da gente gastar litros e litros de água, a gente só gasta 350 ml com o serviço da lavagem de carro ecológica, que já deixa o carro limpo e encerado. E aí então veio o edital do Pipa, que é o Favela. E a gente se inscreveu no edital. Eu tive muitas aulas de administração, de marketing, como divulgar meu trabalho, como receber bem meu cliente, como me posicionar no meu salão de beleza. Porque antes eu tinha só um salão, né? Hoje não, eu já estou completa. E assim, estou me, me profissionalizando para ficar assim, sempre melhor. A gente não trabalha mais para patrão, agora a gente traz as pessoas para trabalhar com a gente. Antes a gente lavava um, dois carros, hoje a gente consegue lavar 40 carros no mês. Mas eu tenho tempo de cuidar da minha casa, porque agora eu tenho funcionários, coisa que eu não tinha antes. Hoje eu tenho recepcionista, hoje eu tenho masoterapeuta, gente que trabalha comigo mesmo. Tem duas cabeleireiras, tem uma manicura. Então, assim, eu não fico só presa no salão. Hoje a Jumara pode sair, hoje eu posso viajar. E tem uma equipe que, mesmo que eu não esteja no salão, cuida de tudo pra mim. Eles ensinaram a gente a fazer a página no Facebook, ensinaram a gente a administrar melhor o nosso negócio, a chegar e conversar com o cliente. Então, de faxineiros um condomínio, agora eu, sou, eu posso dizer que eu sou um microempreendedor. A gente estima, então, que o Favela beneficiou mais de mil pessoas com as nossas ações de educação empreendedora para a promoção dos direitos humanos. Você já acompanha o Favela nas nossas redes sociais? Segue a gente lá e fica por dentro do Corre. Então, 
business accelerator in Brazil. So we are a nonprofit that is trying to encourage to boost what we can call the favela based entrepreneurship. This is a direct opposition to the tech based entrepreneurship that is quite uh, strong in Brazil now. It's receiving a lot of attention from public policies. So we try to draw attention to the entrepreneurship that is going on in slums and that it's keeping the local economies alive and it's keeping the country running and operating. What is the difference for someone who tries to be an entrepreneur in Islam to someone who is becoming an entrepreneur in different scenarios? You have to struggle against a system that it's really not contributing at all for you to have success. You will have to face poor quality education, you have no access to basic service like water and sanitation, you don't have access to good quality health services. So how do you design a business, a project idea and make it successful against all of this? <clears throat> So what do we do in Favela? We directly address the global goals, four and one. You are all familiar with the SDGs, right? And the global goals? Okay. So global goal four is quality education, and number one is no poverty. We try to provide the tools, the technology, the knowledge, so that these people who want to create their own projects and business, they do it with higher chances of success and they do it in a sustainable way. So that video, it's actually from near two years ago. From that, we already changed our numbers a bit. We had seven editions on our programs run. So we offer what we call business acceleration programs. It's a six month training in which people who want to create a sustainable business idea or a sustainable project, they receive all this education and all this qualification to make it happen. We accelerated 164 business in 13 municipalities in the metropolitan region of my city, Pelotizonte, with the support of 200 volunteers and facilitators. And we have managed that, and to do that, we managed over 1 million Brazilian reais in funds, but considering the kind contributions that we get from volunteers and, and partners and companies and NGOs and other universities that are working with us, this means that we have, in less than four years, managed more than 3 million reais. So for a Brazilian social startup and a nonprofit, this is quite a big number. And we are very happy to see that, that we have managed that with a team of eight people. So focusing on Resiliente, Resiliente is like a resilient slum, is the project that was shown in the video that focuses more directly in environmental impact. We designed it with a very interesting partners. It was financed by the British Council and the Newton Fund. And we did it in partnership with a sector of the department of the University of Cambridge. And the goal was to have people in Islam saying, seeing how they could make money out of um, reusing waste, for instance. But also what we do, in, and then I think that's the magic in how we connect. Some of you were asking me that yesterday, how you connect to people, how do you, um, deliver the environmental discourse to them. If I offer a class, a lecture, a workshop on environmental education, on water, or any environment related topic in Islam, I will bet here, I don't know, 1,000 euros that no one would come, honestly. So it's not a topic that it's yet, let's say, I wouldn't say attractive, but it's not perceived yet as important to people to think of environmental issues when you're struggling in your daily life, when you don't know if you're able to pay the bill or if you can put food on the plate for your children. What we do with Favela is we deliver 
this environmental component and the environmental discourse framed in income generation. So when we present people the opportunity to design their own business idea, to create their own business model and live out of this and in generate income not only for them but for their family and for the community, this becomes something that attracts their interest and makes them really happy to subscribe and join our programs. But then when they get in, it's a trap. No, it's not a trap. <laughs> <laughs> we do deliver business acceleration, right? You saw in the video, we offer them knowledge on communications and marketing, on business management, but if there's a strong component on environment education. They all live the trainings knowing what are the global goals, what are the SDGs, what SDGs am I addressing with my project and my business idea? If they're not being entrepreneurs in something that is directly uh, related to environment issues, like uh, you saw a case here, uh, Wenderson, he created an eco co-wash. But if you're not like him, that it's working with something directly related to the environment, at least you know how to operate your own business in a more sustainable way. So if you, fry, if you have a buffet or a restaurant, what do you do with the oil that it's you know, after you cook all the stuff? How are you treating your waste? So at least you acquire this kind of knowledge so that you can operate your business in a more sustainable way. They all get to learn what are the challenges for the resilience of the city. We take them to the wastewater treatment plant. We take them to the, to, I forgot the name in English, but where you put all the trash of the city, like you take, <laughs> what? The landfills, yes. We take them to visit the landfills. So we try to show how the system, how the city works and what are crucial challenges to live in a resilient society so that they can think how their own business and projects are going to address that because they know that this is going to impact their lives. Just exploring a bit more on, on Wenderson. So it's very common, Brazilians, the first thing they want to do when they turn 18 is to have a car. And there are many Brazilians here, you can ask them, it's true, isn't it? We all want like, our first car. I mean, I don't. I don't have a car. But most people are looking for the first car. So we have a big number of cars in cities, and it's very common to have them washed in those at gas stations. And each car wash would use around 300 liters of water for a car. So when there's some, he came to our first project. He, he was in our pilot program. And he had this, this technology to wash cars with a glass of water, 300 milliliters, mix it with the wax of a Brazilian plant. And by the time he would wash your car, he would already wax it. So he'd leave it clean and shiny and beautiful. And then last time, because it's a different process of doing it, it's basically just cleaning the car like this. And when he came to us, he just he had this technology, but that's it. So we showed him, do you have an idea of the environmental impact you create with this? Mm -hmm. Did you figure out how many liters of waters are not being wasted when people wash your car with this? So now he's able to do his business, but also understands the impact that he's creating in the city and even use that in his marketing strategy because he knows a lot of clients are hiring his service because they don't want to have their car washes with 300 liters of water they just want to waste 300 milliliters there are many other interesting cases that uh, we acquired uh, that we helped in the last uh, couple of years but I'll show you some young ideas. This is the group from last year. We had 36 young people from 12 municipalities in the metropolitan region of Belo Horizonte doing our, one of our training programs. And we are very proud of this guy here. 
This is Guilherme. He's our celebrity now because he he's from a landless movement based in the metropolitan region in Brazil. Landless movement um, houses, in, I mean, it's home to nearly one million people in Brazil, so they do not have lands, they are just living in rural areas. And he joined our program last year and he wanted to design a business that would allow young generation in rural areas to stay in the rural areas. He hated the cities. He wants to be there, in the farms. He designed Guarasi. So he modeled a business idea that would go from consultancies, if you want to have a garden in your house, or what we call in Brazil like a productive garden, a garden where you can have food and in your own apartment or in small areas in your house. He also offers ecotourism in his landless movement. He's selling uh, food and products that are produced in a more sustainable way. And we are super proud because after modeling his business idea with us last year, we helped him to apply to the Lush Spring Prize. Lush is a company, a cosmetic company. It's like the beauty shop that work with vegan, uh, vegetarian stuff. And he was among the four finalists for 2018 Lush Spring Prize and received an award a £10,000 grant to start his own enterprise. And they liked him so much that they even got him back to the UK last month <coughs> to perform a training course on agroecology. It's, it's, it's how to, to ecologically produce and farms following the way the nature does, and the way the, the forest does. And now he's going crazy with, uh, 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 with his project. And this also has a very interesting impact because most people in landless based movements, they work with one single crop. In his area, they, work, they produce bananas. So you would walk and you would see only banana, banana, banana. There is no diversity. There is no knowledge on how to make it efficient. And he's providing, you know, an income generation opportunity that it's eco-friendly, that is trying to respect the environment. He's teaching other people in his landless movement on how to produce in a more sustainable way. So I hope these two cases clarify how we connect with water. Does it? Great. <laughs> Just to show some interesting case, and I think this um, solidifies what the Vice Rector says. Um, this is a very special moment for me, for my life. This is from last year, the UNESCO NGO Forum 2017. And Favela was in his third year. We were just starting. Um, a new uh, project with uh, young people going on. And we had the opportunity to go to UNESCO NGO Forum and there was a pitch competition going on. Do you know what's a pitch? No? Who knows can explain to those who doesn't? Nobody dares to? You know? Yeah, tell them what it's a pitch. Selling your idea. Yes. In a short time. In a short time. <laughs> so pitch is very important when you are an entrepreneur. You have to sell your idea, sometimes in a minute, two minutes. That means we had 90 seconds, which means a minute and a half, to tell what we do, why we do, what we want to do in the future, and try to dispute, to, to compete for an award of $30,000 that were being sponsored by MISC Foundation from Saudi Arabia that was hosting the UNESCO and Bar. When we heard about the competition, we applied, I applied wearing my hat of the Water Youth Network. João applied wearing Favela's hat. We both were among the five finalists worldwide. <laughs> among all the 300 NGOs that applied for the competition. And I did a, ended up in the first place, so I made the killer pitch. <laughs> 
and I got thirty thousand dollars for Water Youth Network that you learn more soon. More about it soon. And Joan got the third place and got an award of twenty thousand dollars for Favela. So together we were a couple coming back to Brazil with fifty thousand dollars in the bank. <laughs> But yeah, so I think it's so it's it's good uh, with uh, favela. So just to just to show you this number, just to highlight that what we do we do with partnerships, we do in a network, we do connecting people. So it's also a very good let's say advice when you are trying to make something happen that it's gonna change your reality. Connect to people. You cannot do anything alone. So try to identify stakeholders that are interesting and relevant to what you do, and that's connect with the goals that you want to achieve. And now, oops, oh my God, okay. Uh, okay, coming back here, let's talk about water more specifically. And I hope to be closing soon. Um, when you look at water specifically in Brazil, we still live with 35 million people lacking access to safe water. And 100 million Brazilians without sewage collection, so they basically have no access to the service. This is nearly half of the, this is half of the population as of it is now. So what drives me to be what I would call a water entrepreneur or a water leader? I always use this picture. I don't know if the council would be happy about it. <laughs> but anyway, for me, this is one of the drivers to do what I do. This is the Board of Governors of the World Water Council in 2017. I was actually introduced to the World Water Council while here at IHC. Remember that I said yesterday that at IHC I joined the Water Youth Network, a global community of young people and organizations trying to change the water scenario. And we went to Budapest Water Summit. It was my first ever water event in Hungary, 2013. And then I found out what was this big global governance water world. So the actors existing in this contest, the strategic stakeholders. And this picture showed to me that some people are missing there. And these people are us. So for the first time, the World Water Council started a youth delegates program. It was launched in 2016. It was a result of a lot of pressure, and that's a big thanks to works of people like the young people at the Water Youth Network and the World Youth Parliament for Water and all your other younger groups connected in networks in the water sector that were pressuring for a larger and a meaningful representativeness in the council. The and for the, a lot of alumni, right? <laughs> and now, if you look the pictures from this year, for instance, at least one young person you will see. Because we cannot make the four of us at the same time. The Youth Delegates Program, we are four. We were selected based on the regions of the world. The council divides the world in four big regions. I was selected to represent the Americas. My mandate ends this December. And the new batch is to be announced next week, I believe. So keep looking at the opportunity. Every two years they have the selection process. But at least now we have young people there to say what we think should be said and also to do things that we think should be done. And what did we do for the last two years? And here I cover Water Youth, but also the Delegates Program because I wouldn't be one without the other. These are pictures from moments at the last World Water Forum. The World Water Forum is the biggest water event. It's where you have at the same location the most important actors in the water sector getting together and discussing water issues. 
And what was happening every time we would go to the forum? No young people. Or young people always located and not the strategic moments or positions in the forum. What did we do to change that? We pressured a lot from the beginning of the preparations of the forum. The last forum, and it was in my country in Brazil in March, was the first one to have as principle that every session, every debate should have one person under 35 years old. So if you did not have a session with a younger professional, you would be drunk. You would be at, how you call it, notified somehow, you know? We also had the largest group of young professionals. And this was very due to a project that I'm very happy to have coordinated, which were the youth satellite events to the World Water Council. It was a strategy co-designed with uh, several youth-led organizations. And uh, we came together in the World Water Congress in Cancun, we started our first discussion, drafted guidelines together online, each person in a different location of the world. Those guidelines were ready by last, I think, October. We translated it to Portuguese and to Spanish, got it approved by the council, all by ourselves, and in less than three months, from December to March, young people worldwide, independently, managed to lead over 20 events around the world in 12 countries. And this connected more than 1,000 people into hybrid politics. And this was all in preparation to the forum because they couldn't be in the forum, they couldn't afford to be in the forum, but they want to send their message. They want to contribute to the debate. So every, each event had to generate as output a statement in which you would put there what you think is relevant to your own region, to the geography that you're based. You should produce uh, audiovisual material for social media so that we could raise awareness to more young people. And some people got sponsors to go to the forum. And then you, we had vulnerable youth at the forum sharing their perspectives. And together we worked in a statement, a youth statement that was released in the A4 World Forum. And now we're compiling this amazing experience into an e-book to show how young people are helping achieve SDG 6, which is the one directly connected to water and sanitation. So these are pictures from moments that we had in the forum. And I'm really looking forward for the next steps. If I'm not able to coordinate those, I'll for sure, I'll make sure that others are following this. We're also trying to push to have at least the organizations of the members of the Youth Delegates Program to, be, to receive support to join the council officially so that we have voting rights and have, a, let's say, a more formal means to influence the decisions that are made there. So finally, all I talk about is basically around these two things. More representativeness and more positive impact. There is a test, I don't know if it's an international thing, but I learned it in Brazil, we call it the NEC test. It works a lot to check representativeness of particular girls. So whatever you go, just look around. How many women are there? And how many women should be there in your perspective if you look at the world? If you were what, half of the population, at least half of the people in the room should be women. I mean, in a strategic decision making processes, right? So, if you are in a, sitting in a table and uh, you're discussing development challenges, look around. Do you see people who face those challenges sitting there? Are they contributing to the debate? Are they being really taken into account in the process of designing solutions? So the next test is really interesting. Just, just look. Just look around, whatever you are, and think of actors that should be there and are not. And if they are not, who is representing them? 
And is this person represented in a valid way? Is this person really taking into account the interests and the reality of that group? And that's why yesterday I asked you who you are. Because regardless of your wishes, you represent someone. You represent a social group. I found that also at IG. I arrived here and people would look at me. And first, you are the woman category, right? So what is the situation of woman in relation to water? I had to know the talents. What, 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 what are the struggles that we face in terms of water and sanitation? And then you place me in Brazil, so I'm South America, Latin America. What are the challenges that women there face? And because of the roles and the hats that I wear of Water Youth Network and Youth Delegates program, sometimes I'm the only Brazilian woman, the only Latin American woman in some places and locations. How do I represent them? So you have to know, you have to learn what is their contest. Because they, it's not very often that they have this opportunity. That they have a microphone, that they can voice their challenge, that they can voice what they're struggling with, that they can voice what they know to fix the problem. Because then we do not reproduce colonialist ideas on how to solve issues. So let's listen to them. And that's why it's important to always look at the group and try to think on how to help them. And think of positive impact. To encourage you a bit, this is the picture. I don't have a What If Next Works baby birth picture, but this is a Bella's birth, you know? So this is how it all started. So basically we were a group sitting together in one of the slums in my city and trying to design this that what was our first business acceleration program it was a saturday workshop our first experience together we gathered some friends who were connected by the same goals and we worked on putting on paper what we wanted to do to then make it happen in real life So whenever you, I, I could provide you some, uh, let's say, tools and reference on how to try to organize your ideas better if you want to create a project or start something. But Maria Laura has my contact, it's also here. I made the basic mistake of forgetting my business cards in the zone. but. I'm here, if, I don't know if we have time for questions, I'm so sorry if I spoke too much, but I really wanted to share some of those things with you, so that you know that it's possible, so that you know that you can do it, if I could do it, you could all do it, and you could all do it alongside someone else, because you're not alone in this fight, and really try to think of local level because then you'll be global what we do there is what justifies why i'm here so i think it's the direct proof that if you act global, local you can be global so try to focus even if you think oh there are no development challenges in my region there are there are maybe not in your neighborhood but maybe how your country is doing policies or how they are interacting with other countries, their international relations, there is something that you could change to make the world better. Okay? So thank you. Thank you very much.